Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and these are my top 10 roll and write games. Now, in true Board Game Co fashion, we're going to have 15 games to go over today. We're going to have our top 10 roll and write games, my top 10 roll and write games, but we'll also have five special mentions for a variety of different reasons as to why they're here. And we will start off with the special mentions, although I should say we also should note there will be a giveaway when I get up to, well, one of the special mentions. There's actually going to be a giveaway as well, so we'll go ahead and have the opportunity to, uh, I don't know, type a comment, win some small little thing, nothing, nothing crazy. Crazy. Don't 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 go too crazy here. But let's go ahead and start off with our special mention. Starting off with one which absolutely should be on this list, but isn't. And your long stories to the nature of should be on the list, but isn't. Why is it not on this list? Well, we're going to talk about that. But that's going to be Hadrian's Wall. I think Hadrian's Wall is one of the best roll and write games out there. Now it's not in my top ten because in all my top tens, whether it's my top one hundred games of the year, whether it's a top ten list, they're always given at how I feel about those games at that point in time based on all their criteria. And Hadrian's Wall is one of the best roll and write games I've ever played. But I did find that with all of these games, I've played most of these a lot. Roll and write games are an easy game to table. They're usually easier to table than some large Euro or Ameritrash or who knows what area control. And so almost every single game that's on this table here, I've played anywhere. I'd say most of these games I've played more than 10 times each and some of them more than 20 or 30 times each for these games. And Hadrian's Wall is one that I've played a lot. But for me, as much as I think Hadrian's Wall might be the best mechanically, from a pure mechanical sense, I think it might be the most intricate and might be the best roll wide experience you can ever have. It's also one that didn't hold up as well for repeated plays for me. So it's one that did eventually leave my collection, but I think if you have a chance to try and roll my game, you absolutely should try Hadrian's Wall. It is incredibly intricate. It's incredibly a ton of depth to it. A lot of replayability at first. For me, I found that once you start crossing that 10, 10 play count, for me, I find too much of the game was built on the same foundation and the game experience was too long and too intricate that I did eventually tire of it a bit more. But I think it's an incredible game that's worth mentioning. On a similar note, we have Twilight Inscription, another great roll and write game that I do recommend trying out. Twilight Inscription has a ton of boards, and the boards are different, so it constantly gives you a different challenge, and there's four different boards going on in every single game, and each board gives you a different focus point. While you're going to have to engage with all the boards, the way and order you choose to engage with them is going to result in a different order every single time. I've had a lot of fun with Twilight Inscription. For me, my pet peeve with that one, and the reason it's not here, is I did find over enough plays that I always found there was one particular board that you kind of had to start with that board, and if you did, you'd win unless the other players did, in which case it kind of drove you down the same pathway. And that kind of removed a little bit of the fun from it for me. It's still a game I would happily play, but it is a game I eventually left my collection when I realized that that repetitive nature was only making the gap between myself and other players stronger. And so for me, it's one I'm still happy to play. I still think it's a fun time. I personally think that it's a, there's a strategically sound way to approach the game that if you're not doing, you're running the risk of not winning. And so that is what uh, uh, took it a bit down for me, but I still think it's a game that is worth checking out if you have a chance. I still Still think you have a lot of fun with it, but that does hurt it a bit. I'll also say that another issue with Twilight Inscription is that for me, I found the two-player mode a bit fiddly, the nature of having the uh, arbitrary third element going in for voting and stuff like that, and that also removed it a bit from me, because I do find Roll and Rights, I play at a lot of player counts, but two-player is still one of the more common player, player counts that I'll play Roll and Rights at. Past that, we have Next Station London. And that's the entire Next Station. Next Station Tokyo, Next Station London, I think there's a Paris or France, I don't know. But the Next Station series of games is one that I've played a little bit. Not enough to make its way into my top 10, at least not yet, but it's one that does show promise. I could easily see the Next Station series of games being in the top 10 for my top 10 roll rights. Just right now, I need more plays. I think I've only played them twice. I played one of Next Station London and one of Next Station Tokyo, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. But if you do want to check out a good roll and write, that is definitely on the up and coming for me. One that I think would crack into the, would break into the top 10 for me. It's going to be the Next Station series of roll and writes. Lots of charm them. I just need more time before I put them in my top 10. And then we have two more. Two more are going to be guilty pleasure roll and writes. That again, before we get to the top 10 itself, we have two more that are not present. Those are going to be guilty pleasure roll and writes. They are roll and writes that I really enjoy. These ones I actually have over here because Next Station London I don't actually own. I've only played it on BGE. Hadrian's Wall and Trial Scription I got rid of, but I do have two over here that have made their way into my collection, and I do really enjoy them, but they're a little bit more guilty pleasure. I can't put them into my top 10. I don't think they are the best, but they're just so much fun to play that I, I have them ranked a little bit lower, but I have so much fun with them that I still, I don't know, there's still, there's still, I have a soft spot for them in my heart, which is why we're going to talk about Roll to the Top over here from All Play. Roll to the Top is going to give you a lot of frantic dice rolling and filling in charts as you roll your way to the top. The basic structure starts off with a pyramid, you're working your way up, but then there's eight different maps, I think, 
There might even be more. There's a lot of different maps in this game that are going to give you different ways to roll to the top, different ways of combining the dice and trying to figure out how to roll a bunch of dice, add or remove dice from the dice pool, and slowly make your way to the top of whatever chart you are playing as, as you go through this game. So again, you're going to have, let me just zoom in a bit more over here, you're going to have these little maps over here, you have the Eiffel Tower, you have a pyramid, you have a whole bunch of different ones, and it's all about trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to combine numbers that won't leave you stuck. It is not the best game I've ever played. I don't even know if it's a keeper long term, I just know it's so much fun that I always have a good time playing this one, and it's great at larger player counts as well. Roll to the Top is a lot of fun, definitely recommend this one. Not my favorite, but a guilty pleasure roll and write for me. On a similar vein, we have Rolling Realms, and this is where we're going to have our giveaway. We'll talk about that shortly, but we have Rolling Realms from Stone Mario Games, which is a game that I've played this game, I don't know, at least... Uh, how many can how how long is the solo game because i've gone through the entire solo game and i play this a lot competitively i probably have somewhere in the range of 50 plays of rolling realms under my belt which definitely makes it a game that i've enjoyed now i don't think it's the best or the most intricate but i do think it's highly variable and Stone Mario Games has continued to release expansion packs, little little basically modular packs over here that are going to give you different ways to play different games, both in his own Stone Mario Games universe and catalog, but with other creators as well. And so those packs all keep the game a little bit different, but they're all individual and they don't really network together. So it doesn't have the intricacy that some of these games on the table will have, but it's a game that I always have fun playing with and I've had a lot of fun going through this and trying to optimize and gain those stars and pumpkins and coins and hearts and trying to figure out the best way to just roll dice and utilize them in the correct way based on a variety of different realms rolling realms is definitely again very much a guilty pleasure game in terms of how light this one is but i still have fun playing through this one and going through this one so that's gonna be rolling realms that's where before we dive into the list we do have a giveaway you see over here we have three rolling realms packs which i believe are the most recent realms that have come out we have over here we have dice throne we have eminent domain and we have terraforming mars and i'll be doing a giveaway of these packs for whoever well comments i'll go ahead and pick some a commenter out for whoever types in i guess we're going to use mars in the comment anyone who use put the word mars in a comment and i'll go ahead and i'll pick the winner in the weekend review the, probably next week i'll give this video a little time to go through it you can check out the video description for exact dates and all that stuff but i'll go ahead and these will be shipped um wherever you want internationally wherever whoever wins this over here will be getting these three newer promos packs part of the reason i'm doing this is because i actually designed terraforming mars uh, this promo pack is one i designed a long time ago i want to say a year and a half ago or so uh, jamie stegmeyer was doing one of his live streams and he talked about adding new realms and so i designed uh, just for the fun of it i designed a few realms within game systems that I loved. I believe I did Blood Rage, Terraforming Mars, and one other. I don't remember what the last one was. Maybe it was, was it Vindication? I wonder if it's Vindication. I have to go check the notes and figure that out. But what I do know is regardless of which ones they were, uh, Terraforming Mars is the only one that actually became an actual promo pack. So, uh, fun fact, this is a promo pack I designed. I still haven't played it yet, but hopefully I'll remember that shortly. But if you want to go ahead and win the set of three over here, because I have another set, I have a set myself, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, someone enter Mars in the comment and we'll pick a winner on the weekend review again details in the description down below and with that we're going to go ahead and dive into the actual top 10 let's move these to the side we're going to dive into the actual top 10 starting with a game that is already from a publisher on this table that is going to be on tour this is another game from All Play and one that I've had a lot of fun with over the years, and it continuously holds up. There's a bunch of maps for this. I don't even have the newest map packs for it, but we have USA, Europe. They had more maps in one of the recent expansion crowdfunding campaigns. But overall, this is just a game of rolling dice and drawing cards and trying to make sure that you can make a singular line. Well, you can have other spots on the board, but you're trying to trace a, a path across, a, well, whatever map it is, USA, Europe, or whatnot, by trying to connect various numbers. Now, you want your numbers to be in ascending order, so you don't necessarily need it to be 2, 3, 4, but it needs to to be in 2, 4, 7, 22. It cannot go down from 22 to 21 because once you're stuck there, well, you're stuck. You can't go. You're, you're going in a singular pathway. Along the way, you're trying to visit certain cities and you're trying to make sure you get double points for specific starred cities that you circled along the way, but you're ultimately trying to put numbers into different regions of the board and trying to create a pathway that you'll hopefully be able to draw by the end of the game. It requires a lot of planning, a little bit of intuitive guesswork, some knowledge of odds, but overall it's just a satisfying experience that is easy to table, had a lot of fun with this one over the years and it continuously holds up even as many games enter and leave my collection on a regular basis on tour is one of those well rights that still has managed to hold strong in fact basically almost everything here there's one that's like on the newer newer side but almost everything else here has definitely been doing fine for a long time now Coming at number 9, we have the Isle of Cats Explore and Draw. This one takes the Isle of Cats universe, a game that I really wanted to love, but ultimately found myself just being okay with, and it distills the best parts of the Isle of Cats into a shorter, easier-to-play game. And it removes the drafting, which I usually love drafting as a mechanic, but in Isle of Cats, I find I don't love the drafting. I don't find it as tense or interesting as I do in other drafting games. This takes the best parts of Isle of Cats and basically
basically distills it into an easier to table game. It removes some of the stuff that the expansion, so like the expansion of Wildcats, if you do have that, there's some nice things you have there that you won't have in this. But again, for the price point, for the game time, for the sheer accessibility, I think this gives you the best of Wildcats in a small box. And it's going to be a roll and write Wildcats. You can have cards that go into a grid which players are going to be choosing from every single round, and you have the ability to utilize certain extra abilities down here to pick different benefits or cards or whatnot. And you're trying to get various lessons all as you fill your grid while filling in the various cat shapes in this roll and write game. Again, it does the best parts of Isle of Cats in an easy to table format. If you like the Isle of Cats, or if you don't like the Isle of Cats for that matter, this is one that's worth checking out. If you like polyominoes, if you like roll rights, I recommend checking out the Isle of Cats in another white box that looks very all play adjacent, but is not an all play game. Coming in at number nine, we have Fleet the Dice Game over here. Fleet the Dice Game is going to be coming to you from the team that have done, well, a bunch of these Roll and Rights. They've done French Quarter, Motor City, they've done uh, Three Sisters, and Fleet the Dice Game is the first one they did that brought their game to fame or claim to fame or whatnot. Coming to you from uh, Benjamin Pinchback, Matthew Riddle, this is a f version of Fleet, which is interesting because this is one of the few times where the offshoot game is better than the original game. Fleet is a game that was okay. It was received okay. I don't think there's anyone who loves, loves, the, oh, I'm sure there's someone who loves the game, but overall, Fleet was a game that was received as being an okay game. And Fleet the Dice Game initially didn't get a lot of buzz because it was a dice game variant of a game that was never that popular to begin with. Again, popular enough. I'm going to keep hedging my words over here. It's not the best rated. And Fleet the Dice Game, I don't think, uh, launched to that much critical claim right away because of that. But over time, this became a sleeper hit that many people continue to pick up and rave about as being a better experience than the game it was based on, which again, is an uh, is an anomaly in the space. Usually you have popular games, then you create roll and rights or, or, or card games or variants of those games that are usually not as good as the original. In this case, the knockoff is better than the original. And part of that is because of how highly intricate this game is. In the game, you are trying to do everything first. You're going to be rolling dice, you're going to be taking from a shared pool and then a common pool as all players get the last remaining die and you're trying to move up various tracks you're gonna have two full sheets of paper in this game you're gonna be trying to move up these various fish tracks over here they'll all give you different licenses and boats to gather more fish every single round while unlocking abilities meanwhile you're also placing dice into these various buildings or these various harbor spots over here trying to get as many rewards as possible with so many different avenues as far as how to try to place your dice your pips and gather as much growth across the course of the game as across those 10 rounds of play it's very intricate lots of people play, play Ability, lots of different ways to approach the same puzzle. If you like games that have cascading bonuses, where you're going to have that one turn where you do seven things because you got this, which unlocked that, which marked off a pip over here. You got two dollars here. You spend those on an extra thing over there. This will have that daisy chaining bonuses and rewards. Very rewarding, enjoyable experience. That's going to be Fleet the Dice Game. Coming at number eight, we have the newest game on this list. This is the only game on the list that I think is a new title, but we have, again, new is a relative term, but let's say in the last year, although even then there's a caveat to that, and that is going to be uh, Draft and Write Records. I really enjoy Draft and Write Records for all the same reasons that I just said about Fleet the Dice Game. This is coming to you from Inside, Inside Up Games. I did have a chance to play the prototype, so I've played this over a year ago, but I played this a bunch when I had it as a prototype, and I've played it a bunch more since it's actually arrived. Again, I said I think every game on this list has at least 10 plays of it, and that's true even for Draft and Write Records, which is a fairly recent addition to the table over here. But Draft and Write Records is going to give you that same daisy chaining cascading bonuses, but this time around, you're trying to, well, draft. You're drafting cards, and the drafting does work in this game, but you're drafting cards cards and you're trying to manage your band. You're going to be drafting a bunch of things that are going to be going into this grid over here. So you basically have your, your band that you're trying to build out. You're going to be drafting cards that represent different band members. But you're also trying to get spots in this grid, spots in this grid. You're trying to travel on this path over here. You're trying to do a little bit of everything. And you're trying to be mindful of the various bonuses as well because those are going to be a chunk of extra points and often in-game rewards that you're getting as well. And so every single thing connects. Every single thing gives you extra actions or icons, all designed to give you as much replayability or as much ways to approach the game as possible as you go through it. Draft Night Records is a great time. And again, if you like that kind of daisy chaining goodness that you see in Fleet the Dice game, this is one that's worth checking out. From there, we're going to go ahead and move to our number seven, I think. I think we're at number seven. I always lose track of this. We have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. One, six. Number six over here is going to be Three Sisters. Three Sisters, from the exact same design as I already mentioned, from Fleet the Dice Game people over here. We have uh, Ben, ben uh, Pinchback, and Matt Riddle over here. This time under their own company, Motor City Games, that have done... Um they have done Motor City, and they've done uh, the French Quarter. Motor City's not here, because as much as I do like Motor City, I do think I like it less than the other ones, and French Quarter's not here, because I haven't played that one enough, so I don't yet have a good, strong opinion of that one. I haven't, I've played it, but only only a few times. Anyways, uh, Three Sisters over here. Three Sisters is going to be, arguably, better than a Fleet the Dice game. I mean, for me, at least, it's better, because it's higher on this list. But Three Sisters builds on that same kind of aspect. You're going to be having dice drafting in the game. You're going to have a shared die that's remaining on the board as you dice draft in this little round robin over here. But this time, you're planting crops. Same kind of 
visual aesthetic as you have in Flip the Dice game. If you've played one, they're definitely going to feel like they're similar. You have all your abilities down over here. You have all these crops that are trying to grow as opposed to harvesting fish or gathering fish. You're basically growing props over here. You have all these little orchards that you're trying to grow as well. And again, similar to Fleet, there's so many different ways to get bonuses, to push on those levers, to try to get a little higher score every single time you play. It is an incredibly rewarding experience that has all the same things I like about Fleet the Dice game. For whatever reason, I like this one a drop more, which is why it's a, a drop higher on this list. But uh, Three Sisters, if you like either of these games, I highly recommend checking out the other one because they're both very similar in the approach that they give. Both of these are highly worth checking out. Coming at number five. I think we're number five, four, three, two, one. I think I, I can't keep track. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. We're up to five over here. I'm sorry, I can't, can't, I can't count as I go through this. Coming at number five, we have one that... Uh, I, this one I debated where to put it. I put it at number five. There's arguments to be made to put it higher up on this list, but I do go back and forth with how much I enjoy this one. But this is Cartographers, and regardless of how much back and forth I go, I definitely still enjoy this one a lot. Now, I can't show you the back of the box because this is the deluxe edition. doesn't show you all the fun things, but Cartographers... This is the collector's edition. It has the base game in it. It has uh, cartographers' heroes. It has regular cartographers. But in this game, you're basically going to be placing a uh, you're placing polyominoes onto this board over here. You're gonna be drawing polyomino shapes onto a bunch of boards. And there's a ton of map packs for this game as well, by the way. If you want, if you want various of the game, I have a few of them in here, but there's a whole bunch I still don't even have. There's going to be different ways to fill out these polyomino boards with different, like, you know, little elements or diving deep down into a dungeon over here. And you're trying to basically fill out polyomino shapes onto these while going through a variety of goals that you have every single round. Because every round is going to give you different goals. There's a ton of goal cards in the game giving you slightly different puzzles as far as what you're trying to do and why. Are you trying to get your mountains to connect to each other? Are you trying to get your, your green spots on the edge of the board? Are you trying to, I don't know, get your uh, giant sections of red spots or your settlements in the game as you go through it? Overall, there's a ton of gameplay going on in here. A ton of variability to the maps you play, to the goals you're going through, all while you try to ultimately flip cards every single round and try to draw polyomino shapes onto your board. And there are some people, by the way, there are some people who can draw. This is a game where, for me, when I play it, I just draw little, little colors and whatnot. Speaking of which, this is a game I actually almost got rid of one time because, as much as I liked the game, and I said this in my whole games leaving the collection video, I was like, I love the game, but I just I find it so tedious to draw all these different shapes to make it stand out, and I find it hard to say to see everything. And someone said in the comments, a few people said in the comments, "Well." use colored pencils which was a thing i hadn't thought of and wasn't doing at that point i kept the game started using colored pencils when the deluxe edition came out they even include colored pencils in this but it changed the game a ton it makes the game so much easier to table i always enjoyed the game but i found it was not the best experience when you're trying to draw the shapes as opposed to just using colored to colors to represent the polyominoes so if you are someone who's tried cartographers and have the same issue it's worth knowing that this to me is a top roll in my game once you make that adjustment at least for me but anyways i like this one a lot as polyominoes it has rolling right it has a ton of fun as far as the variability going on i'm a huge fan of variability in games and this gives it to you in spades between the different game modes between the maps i need to pick up the most recent map packs because i still don't have those yet that is going to be cartographers from thunderworks games coming at number four number four we have if I can get this over here, that make everything else fall over. We have Railroad Inc. And I have the deluxe edition for everything over here. And fun fact, by the way, Horrible Guild, they are coming out with Railroad Tiles or something like that. I think it's called Railroad Tiles, which is going to be built in the Railroad Inc. universe, but with uh, tiles. So it's not going to be eligible for a roll right game, but just in case you like Railroad Inc., it's worth knowing that. But Railroad Inc. is going to have you rolling dice and then trying to draw shapes on your various uh, boards. There's the blue edition, the red edition, the green edition, and the yellow edition. And there's a whole bunch of modules as well. This comes with all five of the things, a full box full of modules. And each of the various editions comes with different cards or different dice, I say, different dice that'll give you different things to try to adjust. Do you have meteors popping down? Do you have like various trees and different things or lakes? All these different stuff happening in the game. And the red, the yellow edition and the green edition also even have the addition of bonus cards, which gives you additional bonuses to go for even as you try to optimize your score. I find the game system just, it's a good game to begin with, but it's a better game when you have all the various stuff for it. There's so much variability to the experience, there's so much fun to rolling those dice and trying to get as much, uh, the best score, best connection point as you go through it and the various game modes keep the game interesting so this is a game that you can't i mean you could get bored of it i guess but i have a hard time getting bored of it because of how different the various things are i still haven't played with a bunch of the modules because i don't need to every single time it's so much fun to go through and the modules just elevate and add to the variability of experience railroad inc a delightful roller in my game that i definitely recommend you check out if you like rolling dice connecting various things drawing fun shapes and again you could have fun with the uh, creative genius behind how well you draw your shapes both cartographers and railroad inc really support players who want to go all out on their visual representation of what they're drawing as they go through it. Coming at number three, 
we have Welcome to the Moon. Now, Welcome to Your Perfect Home is a great game that I really enjoy. Welcome to Las Vegas was a offshoot that wasn't as good as Welcome to Your Perfect Home. And Welcome to the Moon, to me, builds off what Welcome to the Moon, Welcome to Your Perfect Home did best, and this one does it better. This is a one to six player roll and write game, which is going to give you a ton of maps, as well as a legacy game mode that I don't know if I care for as much, but I just like the basic idea of having these eight different maps to go through that all build on what Welcome to the Moon did. In general, in the game, you can be drawing three cards and combining those three cards with the backs of the three cards next to it, which always gives you a combination of a number and an action. Those numbers and actions are going to combine, but every player at the table chooses one combination. So I might choose, you know, the 14 with the tree, and you might choose the 11 with the whatever. And you're trying to combine these different actions because each map gives you different ways of what you're trying to do in the game. This builds off what Welcome to Your Perfect Home did. The basic starting map is a little boring. If you play this game only ever at the basic starting map, understand you're only getting a partial experience. But once you elevate past that, I would say the second map onwards really starts giving you more interesting decisions space as far as what you're trying to do as you launch off into space because thematically you're launching off into space you're going to start trying to break off little sections over here and try to fill various satellites and all these different things but each map gives you a different puzzle to go through i like some more than others full transparency i, I one i thought was okay but you know not necessarily the most interesting the last one i thought was overly tedious and complicated but i would say almost every of the other ones i definitely enjoyed to a large extent i would argue these two might be my favorite over here but this one's pretty good and this one's pretty good honestly the middle ones the middle ones are all great one one, one is a good intro, and eight was, I thought, convoluted. But the rest are all great experiences. This gives you eight little roller mites in a box, effectively. It builds on the system what Welcome to Your Perfect Home did, but this one does it better because it just gives you more variability to the experience, while again, again, each of these is a different minigame, utilizing the same system. For my number one, well, we'll talk about it more with my number one, but overall, if you want a arguably the most gameplay for the lowest price point ratio is going to be Welcome to the Moon. Highly recommend checking this out if you like that series or that concept from anything I described. Coming at number two is possibly the role that I've played the most. Possibly. I'd have to think it through. It might be that or Rolling Realms over here. But coming at number two, we have My City Roll and Build. My City Roll and Build, the reason I've played this one so much is because it gives you 12 episode arcs. So I've played this, I want to say I've played it at least three full times, which would be 36 minimum plays. So I think I've played other Roll and Rights more. I think I've played Rolling Realms more and possibly some others. I have to, I've played some of these a lot. Cartographers, I've played a little, I, I, this may not be the most, never mind, I take it all back. Roll Rights are so easy to play. That's why I like them so much. You can get so many games them. But My City Roll and Build is just an excellent time. This builds off the infrastructure of what My City did well, but surprisingly, I like My City Roll and Build almost as much. I thought it was going to be like a, hey, play this once and move on from it, but I think this is absolutely fantastic. It gives you the same core experience, but this time you're rolling dice. You're going to be rolling dice, which will create different polyomino shapes. You might notice a trend over here of polyominoes and Roll and Rights. They, they do go well together. But you're going to be rolling dice, which will give you polyomino shapes. You're going to be drawing those shapes based on the other die onto your grid across an evolving set of 12 games with iterative rules that will change what exactly you're doing as you go through it. So the same core state is there, but it basically gives you 12 little maps to go through because you get small adjustments. Oh, this is happening now. Oh, that's happening now. Now you need those, those together. If you've played My City from Rainer Knizia, this very much feels like a good roll and write implementation. Different enough to have a reason to own, similar enough to be called My City, and almost just as fun. I played My City so much more, don't, 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 don't get me wrong, but My City roll and build is a fun experience that is easy to table and kind of drives you to play through it a lot. My biggest critique against it is if you're looking for a one-shot roll and you can play with your friends, this might not be it. This is the kind of thing you want to sit down when you have a, 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 a consistent group who wants to play through it and just go through it again and again and again because I don't think this is as much fun to one-shot. I kind of want to play the full arc of 12. Even now, to this day, there's a game of this on the middle of a Grant Lion from Ga Grant's Game Rex. I started a playthrough of this with him a while ago and uh, never finished it. And I still feel a sense of non complete from that so that's gonna be the one complaint I give against this but it is an excellent experience that is a lot of fun to go through and my number one is going to be another series of games so to speak although this one without a deluxe collector's box this is going to be the Ganshan Clever series of games starting off with Ganshan Clever which is uh, that's pretty clever then we have uh, we have over here we have twice as clever which I actually have played but then I lost it and uh, so I bought another one and then I found the other one so I gifted the other one I have a new one over here we have a uh, we have clever cubed over here for the third one in the set and then we have clever forever for the the fourth one on the set. There's also Clever Kids, which I haven't played that one yet either, but I have. But I would say that to me, that's pretty clever. The first one, Ganshan Clever, is the one that stands out the most as being the best in the series. This, to me, is still my favorite for all right game slash series, again, with this one being the best one for me. But the basic idea is all the times I've talked about chaining a uh, 
bonuses. All the times I've talked about draft night records and three sisters and fleet the dice game and the ways you chain together different bonuses. That's going to be so true for Ganshan Clever. I think this is the game that kicked off this style of roll and write game. There's so many roll and writes out there, but there's those that are a little bit more procedural as far as what you do. Things like you know I don't know My City or or Railroad Inc. Things that are great games that they don't escalate. And then there's games that give you chaining bonuses and rewards. Hadrian's Wall, which I mentioned, which is arguably the best in the genre. Again, limited replayability for me, but the best in terms of the sheer uh, greatness of the individual experience you get. I think that's all based off of that, off of, off of what what that's pretty clever did to begin with. I think this one gave you chaining bonuses because in this game, what you're going to be doing is you're going to have this box over here and you're going to have this little grid of, of numbers. You're rolling dice every round and placing numbers in different grids. But as you get rows or columns or different ascending aspects in these grids, you're going to keep getting bonuses that ricochet to the various other grids. So like some of these other games on the table I mentioned, you're going to have turns or games where you just get so much done in the game. On a single turn, you'll get so much done just because it all all cascaded beautifully together. This to me is still one of the most satisfying in the business as far as what it does. As a whole offshoot of games, if you want that variability, I would say I probably played the original as much as all of the other ones combined because I still think this is the best. But if you want to mix things up, I do think these are fun experiences to go through. But that's pretty clever. It's going to be my favorite roll and write game of all time at least as of this video. And that's basically my list. Let me know which ones you think I've missed in the comments down below. I'll try replying if I've played them. There's a lot of Roll My Games out there, and I've played a lot of them, and some of them are absolutely amazing, and I think they're great experiences. Others, I've, you know, decided that they're good experiences, but not necessarily for me, because I could only play so many games at any given point. But these are 10, or I guess 15, of some of my favorite games in the, in the, um, in the genre. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.